thank you very much for coming to this roundtable um, hosted by WEM and WIPAC. The subject of this roundtable is waste, wastewater-based epidemiology. And I've got something to admit, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not even a microbiologist. So I'm a bit of a novice here, uh, but I am a bit of a digital transformation geek. And during the pandemic, I saw some amazing work done by two amazing organizations. And I invited those organizations here. One is IDRICA and the other is KWR. And during the pandemic, we saw information that went back to the heart of the wastewater industry. The wastewater industry is based upon public health engineering to do good for people. There was a survey 20 odd years ago by the British Medical Journal and the British Medical Journal voted that public sanitation, sanitation has done more for people's life than anything else. And that's the doctor saying that. So obviously 20 years later, modern medicine, et cetera, it may have changed a little bit, but sanitation has added 20, 20 years to people's lives. That is a really important fact. Now, wastewater-based epidemiology in Spain, in Holland, helped the pandemic greatly. It is a very, very powerful tool. So the question is, why aren't we using it? Why isn't it more mainstream? I remember a few years ago um, hearing about microplastics and then a year or two later, the whole subject blew up in the world. And all we're talking about now is plastics. Before that, years and years and years of research had been going on, but hidden from the public. I can actually see that now with wastewater-based epi epidemiology. So for this round table, I wanted to get a group of experts together, representatives from CEH, from sensor companies, from IDRICA, from KWR, from water company and Global Omnium, and have a chat. And this is gonna be, there's no agenda here, this open fireside chat between experts. Anyone who's here can join in. Type in, in the chat if you want me to ask a question. But I'm gonna go around everyone and say, there's a question today. What value does wastewater-based epidemiology bring to society in the future? So I'm gonna pick somebody from the panel and get them to answer that question. And then we'll go around everybody and have a chat. So Gertan from KWR. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell me your thoughts on that on that question? Yes, thanks, Oliver. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, happy to be here and honored to be invited uh, on this platform. Um, I'm, uh, I'm I was part of the, what uh, your introduction, uh, the, what you could call the old school hygienists, uh, looking at uh, sanitation systems uh, and health but from the perspective of um, sanitation uh, being uh, uh, containing pathogens and that any uh, system where you would start to reuse the water or use the water that you need to have a pathogen barrier. So I'm coming from that perspective and um, recognizing the great um, contribution of sanitation and to a public health but also that the main achievements were around a century ago. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and now it is up to us to uh, maintain these achievements. Uh, so uh, as hygienist, you, put, you raise the finger sometimes to say, hey, if you wanna reuse that water, hey, if you want to build this cooling tower, uh, look out for the, uh, for the pathogens. Uh, but um, the, what we really see now is a, a truly a, a, a paradigm change, uh, or maybe it's not a change, it's an, something added. Uh, and that is the use of wastewater as information source for public health. Uh, and um, yeah, that's it. So it came from the, the our initiative came from the, from the hygienic uh, question. So uh, is there any health risk associated with the presence of SARS-CoV-2 uh, in, uh, in wastewater, but it shifted, uh, really quickly shifted gears to, uh, 
can we use um, virus data, virus monitoring data from the wastewater as an information source? And the and, um, answer is yes. And then the question is, of course, uh, that you raised, what is the added value of uh, wastewater over all the other surveillance that uh, people in public health are doing? And I think that was also the principal question of public health agencies that were super busy in the... the um, uh, fighting the pandemic. So uh, any health agency that you approach and said, hey, you could also look in the wastewater. Said, yeah, but we're super busy with all these, uh, uh, the things that we're doing. So why should we want to look in wastewater um, uh, and under these conditions? Well, I think um, there are some um, clues to uh, why. Uh, one is uh, early warning. Uh, I think there are, if you look at uh, around the world, there are uh, many examples of where uh, the rise in wastewater was seen before uh, the, the trend was observed in, um, in uh, cases. Uh, and that's uh, not because there's some magic uh, there, but I think because uh, it's mainly caused by delay in clinical testing. So we have an advantage as if we do our job uh, well and quick uh, to see the, the, the cases uh, before uh, they, um, as they go to the toilet, but before they go to the, the testing facilities, get tested and the testing gets reported. So early warning is one. Um, another uh, major um, uh, added value of wastewater is uh, what I call the objectivity. Um, and uh, that is everybody's going to the toilet, not everybody's going to the testing streets. So meaning that, um, the, the the information you get from uh, all the, the the clinical testing that that we we see in the newspapers and the, that the the decision makers have to take lockdown or reopening decisions on, they are biased biased by human behavior and um, some in some city areas there will be less people going to the testing street than in other city areas um, because of many factors. Um, uh, in some times, uh, we, saw, we saw it um, in the Christmas holidays and in other holidays, people don't get uh, tested. But if you take, as a government, take a decision that you uh, can reopen uh, if everybody gets tested, all of a sudden, many people get tested. Uh, and um, so there's a lot of bias in uh, the testing street data. Uh, but um, that is, uh, if you then compare that to the sewer signal, um, the sewer signal is more objective. So as a complementary uh, indicator of what happens in society, I think it's a very valuable one. And uh, then a third one um, is also uh, the rapid assessment of emergence of variants of concern uh, that you can also pick up from the, from the, from the wastewater. Um, and then I'll stop here because um, I think uh, I've already said a lot of words. Thank you, Gertan. Andrew. Yeah. Um, well, there, there are still a few things that haven't been said, but I, I completely agree with everything that you've just heard. Um, <clears throat> I think wastewater offers a, it's basically a new tool uh, in the toolbox. I, I suppose it's new to many people, maybe not new to the people who've been doing surveillance on polio, but uh, it's wider application to you know, almost anything um, that travels through wastewater. So it could be, <clears throat> could be pathogens, could be health indicators, um, markers, biomarkers, um, could be uh, chemicals that are consumed, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals. Um, it, you know, you can use wastewater as a way to understand whether there's compliance in prescribing. Um, so, you know, you, you know what you're prescribing uh, might be or is in some countries. And uh, if you know what you should be finding <clears throat> in the wastewater, but you find a fraction of that, um, within reason, you could estimate the amount of people who are not taking the drugs that they've been prescribed. And so there are studies um, that have demonstrated this. And, you know, antibiotics are one of those. Um, half the antibiotics that people are prescribed are actually consumed. And so that is uh, one of the reasons why it's really hard to match up wastewater data with prescribing data. And this can sort of uh, be applied to just about anything. 
uh, so long as you have prescribing data. And then, of course, there's the illicit drugs, which um, goes on in the background, uh, which, to be honest, we, it, it's nice to be able to separate these two threads. So one is, in the UK, they focus on health protection. Um, and so all of the efforts to do wastewater surveillance are, at the moment are focused on health protection and uh, with no interest in combining that with any law enforcement kind of activity. So um, I don't speak on their behalf, but I'm just sort of telling you that. Um, um, and then there's another area which I won't uh, get into too much, just because uh, there's a lot to be said, is that there are, you know, transport hubs are really of interest. So if you want to know what's moving where and where it's moving through, you know, uh, ports, airports, um, these are really interesting areas to start asking questions about what's going where. And, um, and it would be very valuable data for informing models for, you know, a global model of pathogen transmission, to be honest. Um, if we all stayed in the same place, uh, it would be a very easy model to design. But as soon as we all start getting on planes and trains and automobiles, then it becomes a lot more difficult. I'll stop there. We can certainly expand on that in, in a little bit. Hakawa, I think probably is best to come on to you. I know Andrew mentioned polio there, and I, if I remember correctly, that was the work that Idrika did in developing wastewater-based epidemiology. And then the coronavirus pandemic hit and Idrika rotated. I think one of the most impressive things that I saw in the pandemic was the visualization that Idrika managed to do um, of, of looking at, at particular zones within, within a city. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose the transport almost comes there. You can possibly see patterns of, of people shifting around. What was the experiences, and probably this is you as well, Paloma, what were the experiences in Valencia um, what was this experience of Idrica? Yeah. yeah, well, uh, hello everyone. Actually, I'm always one of the specialists at Idrica. And well, the first thing I would like to say is very grateful to see so much interest in this important topic. So it's a real pressure for us to be here at this event. And uh, well, it, it seems that is a, a kind of a shift in our perspective on epidemiology. And what we are seeing nowadays is global organizations uh, such as UNESCO, World Economic Forum, showing the concerns over the emergence of new viruses and or new COVID variants that can pose a threat to our uh, global system. So um, as other experiences in, in Holland from the Netherlands, for, for instance, we have developed this early warning system in the city of, of Valencia and other cities in the United States. And this spread has proved to be uh, a total success. So what we did, we, we used this wastewater-based epidemiology in, in combination with, um, with technology to, to track the occurrence of the virus in, in the population so that uh, public authorities could take preventive actions and, and corrective actions. And so here, so if, if this has worked well with COVID, why not using it with our kind of viruses such as flu or, or RSV or even biomarkers uh, to track habits in populations, uh, habits in tobacco or alcohol, for instance. So um, here I'd like to, to highlight in, from our experience the create a unique data model that was one of the greatest uh, values in, the, in this project because we're gathering data coming from ERPs, SCADAs, laboratory information management systems, 
uh, GIS or even third party applications to, to gather data from demographics or hospital occupancy rates or statistical uh, information coming from um, public authorities. So uh, by gathering all of these data and, this, and standardizing them into a single unique uh, data model, we were able to create this information that the user and the public authorities were, were requesting. Uh, so we were able to develop these uh, graphs, indicators over time and advanced algorithms. So this is why many uh, authorities and public um, health authorities in Spain use this early warning system to to take some actions like, for instance, intensifying disinfection in certain areas uh, of, of the city of Valencia or launch awareness campaigns to promote good hygiene uh, habits or to protect vulnerable, um, the vulnerable population such as people over 65, children, for instance. So there are many uh, use cases. Of course, they carried out certain um, lockdowns, specific lockdowns in neighborhoods because this was very opposed to other policies that were undertaken in other countries, such as China, where they use this zero policy, uh, zero tolerance against the virus, where by just uh, identifying a small group having coronavirus, they just carried it, carry out the lockdown of the entire city. So, well, here um, I would like to highlight once again this uh, the, the important role played by by technology, and and this is why. Uh, this project started being an, an emergency project to um, to deal with a critical situation in the city of Valencia, and it ended up being seen by the authorities as a long-term tool that could be incorporated in uh, in their roadmap to the smart city uh, goal. So uh, I think there is a, a huge field um, and important challenges ahead of us in the future. Um, that, that's an interesting point around smart cities because I think they're saying by is it 2050, 70 percent of the population will be in cities. Um, and yeah, then you can see the value as people come together. Um, also in Spain, people do tend to be quite a lot of the population is, is tended to be in cities. So. There is, I suppose, there is that value in in public health monitoring to for that smart cities approach. I think that is that fair, fair to say that, or is it a yeah. bit naive? Or no, you're totally right. <laughs> you're totally right. It's, it's yeah. an interesting approach because I know uh, we we talked about narcotics, and I know wastewater based epidemiology has been used. The narcotics tracking in in Australia um, and prescription drugs as well is, is an interesting point. I suppose is is that where the value lies? Well, I think that the more data we can connect to the model, the yeah. more use cases we'll have in the future. So, I mean, there is. There's also another important thing that is going on nowadays is the antimicrobial resistance. Mm -hmm. This is what we are seeing, especially yeah. because of the occurrence of this uh, emerging contaminant in wastewater. Because wastewater is kind of the the uh, is a perfect environment for the development of this antimicrobial resistance mm -hmm. with warm temperatures, long hydraulic retention times, pathogens, yeah. antibiotics. Yeah. Uh, so this is a perfect environment to develop this. Antimicrobial resistance. So I'm I'm really sure that in the near future we will see new use cases in that field. So we will use this wastewater-based epidemiology in combination with the monitoring of other parameters such as antibiotics mm. to to track. And there's also more use cases related to the wastewater treatment plants. Uh, mm. Wastewater treatment plants nowadays have treatments just focus on uh, the removal of organic matter and phosphorus, nitrogen, mm. but I'm sure in the future we'll focus more on on the removal of this kind of uh, emerging contaminants uh, well, with it advanced was, treatments. It was quite interesting. There was um, a program in the UK, uh, I'd say about three or four months ago, where there was a researcher looking at bacterial phages 
in uh, in wastewater in, in a, a large wastewater treatment works and was looking at the phages within the wastewater. And bear in mind, I know nothing about phages, my microbiology. The closest I've come to microbiology was in my first job where I worked next door to the, to the water microbiology lab. Um, Paloma, I know you can help more on that. Um, but they were they were looking at the inlet of a wastewater treatment works and seeing what valuable phages there were in there for potential medical applications. Is that a bit of hysterical publicity not quite being right, or is, is, is that actually genuine? What, what are the thoughts? Is, is there value in wastewater in, in so far as, yes, we can, I'm, microbiology really isn't something we've ever li really looked at in wastewater. So, hi, hi everyone. <laughs> I, I, finally, yeah. I finally made it in. I had the wrong <laughs> link. I thought you were just shutting me out. Uh, I've just obviously just parachuted into the middle of a conversation. I hear about phages. Uh, it'd be interesting to see that bit of work. Um, obviously, phages have um, influence in treatment plants in terms of, um, for example, the ammonia uh, oxidation process. Um, you know, so I, you know, at Newcastle University where I was previously. Um, Matt Brown, for example, has done a lot of study on on that, the link between the phage and microbial populations. So these are things that drive processes and potentially cause process failure. Um, so from a say a negative aspect, phages are very important. Um, he hasn't published that work, I think, yet. I'm planning to, but I was interested to hear that people are looking to extract phages out for other purposes, for positive purposes. So it'd be quite interesting to see that. But yeah, the microbiolo microbiology goes hand in hand with all the stuff that you're involved in. And it's interesting you also note that that's not something people pay too much attention to, but mm. um, for things like WBE more broadly, it is a fantastic opportunity because of the multidisciplinary uh, approach that needs to be taken and if you miss one of those uh, fields out it may be weaker for that so uh, apologies for being late and missing previous conversation but I'm sure I'll pick up uh, um, on further points. Now, now you're here Matthew I know you're, you're obviously with the Joint Biosecurity Centre I know there's projects that are starting up looking at at wastewater-based epidemiology? Well, I mean, you could argue that we've been doing WBE since um, July last year when the, the Wastewater Surveillance Programme kick-started. Um, just for clarification, we are now transitioned in October to the UK Health Security Agency, um, which is um, a larger org organism, essentially government organ. Um, but yes, um, in the Environmental Monitoring for Health Protection team, which I am part of, um, WBE is a is our core um, work, and obviously beyond beyond the pand current pandemic, we are looking at options around what pathogens and uh, non biologics or chemicals and other factors that we want to to monitor. Um, obviously, it has to be strategic, um, but I think we also are very interested in engaging at a, an international scale because this is an international problem. So, um, you know, sharing knowledge, for example, would be part of that. Um, yeah, so we are, yes, we are active, but obviously at the moment, UK HSA's principal um, uh, aim is to manage the ongoing COVID pandemic. pandemic. So we, we do have our eye on the future and we are beginning that process in, in and Andrew Singer as well is involved in that, but uh, we also... Keep in mind that COVID is still around. Yeah, and uh, I think this is where that's why I brought up this subject for, for for discussion is there's been some great work. Do we need to build on that? And I think the answer is probably yes. Um, and how do we build on that? So, if as as said earlier, which you you, you missed, Matt Hakawa of, of Idrika. Gertan of KWR, some amazing work, and I know you've seen it. Um, 
what value is is that is that so Paloma maybe you can bring this I mean Global Omnium of, of, of course in Valencia I know have worked hand in hand with Idrica because Idrica. the organizations were were linked and Idrica was the spin out of Global Omnium so from a local water company perspective how valuable was it to the water company the, the WBE work well, it was, oh, thank you uh, for inviting me in the first place. Um, it was, it was pretty big. Um, we, well, we've been, we started working in May 2020 and we're, we're still working with, with COVID, with SARS-CoV-2 and wastewater. And we've been through five waves <laughs> And we can, you can, we can see the trends and we can see how the virus has been circulating for this time. And with this information, it's, um, it's helped. Uh, well, we've been reporting to, to, to the public health officials and we can see also they, when they've applied uh, different restrictive uh, measures, we, we can see the effect and the impact uh, these measures have had on the concentration uh, in Valencia, especially in Valencia, because um, people here, we have, um, it's, all, it's in our culture to, to move around cities here because it's so easy to move around with cars. So also the movements have, we've seen, how it has uh, affected also with increasing or decreasing um, SARS-CoV-2 in, in our wastewaters as well. So it's, it's been a it's been a very interesting project. I wish uh, I could um, have a, like a data to show you, but this is just the <laughs> table. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and um, basically, um, we what what we still need to work on is um, interpreting this data. Um, we also, it's a multidisciplinary work. We all need to work together. It's not just uh, our company or the technology. We, we, need, um, we need our public health officials to be working with us. Uh, we need researchers. Uh, we need the health department there as well. And in order for future uh, appliances as well. It's not um, it's not just for us to decide what we need to do in the future. I think it's just a group of people deciding on what's next. Mm. And how difficult was obviously there's a sample program associated with this. And this is probably where I'll bring Jim and Aaron in from Hack because I know they're 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 working on sample programs, etc. How difficult was that sample program? Because obviously there's a cost of, I mean, I know in some places it's, it's, been, um, it's been looked at at the front end of a wastewater treatment works. Obviously that didn't happen in Valencia. Obviously it's more widespread throughout the network and how you've got that down into individual areas. I know hospitals have been looked at as, as potential transmission spots, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe this is Jacobo as well. How's that sampling program worked? What's been the complexities of that? And what's been the difficulties? Jim and Aaron, I, I know Hacker have got some great sampling sampling equipment, and this is probably where I know Hack have looked at coming together with other companies and working on a, a program, a monitoring program. So it's probably a question to all and Gertan as well, probably in, in, in Holland with, with KWR. How's it worked practically? What have been the complications? Well, I, uh, by the way, th thanks for inviting us. Uh, really excited to kind of get into this discussion. Um, one of the things I see is, you know, this is not an exact science. I mean, we we are sampling and, and we're doing a lot of the analysis and, and things kind of move on a day-to-day -day basis. And you really have to have an eye for data. So every element of your program has to be spot on because you're still going to get ups and downs in wastewater. It's just never going to be an exact science. Um, and so one of the things we, we've kind of looked at, you know, since we started this, we've looked at, it'd be interesting I'd like to get into this discussion on kind of pre-vaccine 
COVID monitoring and post-vaccine COVID monitoring because we've seen some really interesting data and you really have to have an eye for it when you're looking at it because when there was no vaccine, I, I saw a great trend. We were doing you know, pilots in you know, community monitoring at wastewater plants, universities, correctional facilities. And um, when we looked early on uh, at the data, you would see these trends and you would get that four to six day advance notice of what's going on, the ups and the downs. And as we look at data today compared to last year, it's one thing I've been looking at uh, compared to last year's, you, you just see kind of a difference in, in the data. And I'd like to see if we're seeing similar things in Europe um, is where, you know, we have communities that might be upwards to 80, 85 to 90% vaccinated, but we're seeing viral loads um, in the wastewater for the same community as high as they were last year at the peak of the pandemic. Um, and, and it's interesting, but we don't see the case counts uh, nearly you know, to the level they were at the pandemic. And, and I'd like to kind of, you know, open this up just to see if other people are seeing, because this eye for data and seeing what's happening and looking at these trends, I feel like it's quite a bit different post-vaccine than it is pre, than it was pre-vaccine, at least from the data that we were seeing. Um, and, and I don't know, it's an open question. When it comes down to kind of like how people use this data, one of the things we've always thought about is just the actionability of the data. And one of the things that really has to happen is this collaboration between wastewater treatment and and uh, the public health agencies, uh, because if you don't, if you keep, you know, if these samples are outsourced and a lot of the wastewater uh, samples are outsourced here in at least in the U.S. and they get sent to a lab, that that delay that happens, you know, the three day delay, five day delay, it loses all that impact if you can really see that data. Um, up front right away and look at the trends and analyze it. And so you really have to be, I feel like <clears throat> the wastewater plants, the public health organizations, they have to get together. And then, um, you know, somewhere that data almost has to be gathered on site. You sample, you get a good composite sample, something that's very representative. So you set your samplers up in a way that is, is most impactful so you can really see good data and then be able to get that data in the same day. The other thing I've seen is like, you know, one day a week, two days a week at testing, it, it may not be, it may not be enough um, because of the ups and downs that we're seeing in a lot of these, uh, you know, if it's a university, if it's a, if it's a wastewater utility, it goes up and down and you need a lot of data points really to see these trends well. And, and that's one of the things we've learned a lot is the more data that you can collect, you know, the more actionable becomes, the easier it is to see the trends. And that's a lot of the things that I see exciting, you know, with wastewater-based epidemiology. Well, definitely not an exact science. So I for data is, is very, very critical. Matthew. Yeah, I, I don't think there's probably others like Gertian want to speak, but um, it, yeah, that was a very good point. And it is, it is, it is the data that's driving a lot of, um, a lot of our insights. And so we need to do, have good process for managing our data and um, analyzing, transforming, modeling the data. But from a sam sampling point, uh, so, you mentioned vaccines, and we also obviously were concerned that um, you know there would be changes in the dynamics of the disease, and therefore into the wastewater uh, post-vaccine. We have done a little bit of analysis without finding anything conclusive, because at the same time you've got the emergent of variants, um, you know, and other factors that in our program, for example, we we um, increased the number of sites we were sampling from our sampling potentially got better. Um, our ways of analyzing in the lab were getting better. So you've got confounding factors there. And passing that to say, has vaccines led to anything? I think we're trying to get knowledge from from um, actually got, you know, the gut, you know, the, the medical side from the, the fecal shedding. The fecal shedding is that being um, disrupted somewhat by vaccines. And there's, if you go down a rabbit hole, and I won't speak on that. As for sampling, just to answer Oliver's question on sampling, uh, obviously we've undertaken a hell of a lot of sampling up to the point where we, I think it's uh, uh, 520 plants um, and 2,000 samples all in a, in a week, something like that, large numbers at different scales. However, we're still pursuing, you know, sampling strategies. We're still working at that because... If we look at the WB in general, you know, we can't have a generic sampling scheme schemata for 
um, different analytes or different locations. They need to be maybe tailored. So you've got to consider in certain cases, you may want obviously composite samples. In other scenarios, passive samples may be better. And so the technology, uh, the, the motivation for technology development is large in the sampling space. But I'll leave it there for maybe others to, to come in. It's, it's interesting because I'll, I'll very briefly interject and probably go to you, Gertan. What we found from the wastewater side is because of lockdown, there was a shift of people away from the larger treatment works to the smaller treatment works as people were living in, in the more rural areas. And it'd be now that's caused problems in the wastewater industry because obviously there were growth schemes on some treatment works. You had that shift of people being locked down and those growth schemes, the need for those growth schemes disappeared. But obviously that would have changed the nature of the wastewater because there'd be more people on rural works. So it's quite interesting. Uh, I can see what you mean by a, a Jim, I think, think you said with different sampling program, because, and Andrew, really, you talked about the shift of people in tran transport. I think you meant transport hubs, but you also saw that shift away from the urban treatment work. So I can use this example just out the top of my head. You saw a shift away from Mogden, which is a big superworks in London, towards the Thames Valley area. Um, and I'm sure that's probably reflected in the wastewater-based epidemiology because of the number of people. It's not possibly not the same as, as so much in, say, Spain, where you tend to have an urban conurbation uh, and one or two plants, where in the UK, I think that the strategy of wastewater treatment distribution is based upon less on an urban conurbation but more on a, on a uh, more spread out pattern yeah that, i think that uh, th th what you're saying is bringing together what uh, i think uh, uh, was already said by several speakers um before me and and that is that there is um yeah you you, you have to really uh, understand your data, not only the the, the data from the, the sewers, but also the, the data that you want to link it with. So the population information, I already mentioned uh, the difference in behavior. Uh, Paloma mentioned the, 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 the transport of, of people. Uh, so I think there's many aspects uh, of, of the data um, that uh, certainly if you want to link uh, the, the information that you get from wastewater um, that, uh, and inf information that you want to get from the population. There's many factors, and Matthew was referring to, uh, and we've also been looking into oh, how does the vaccination affect the signals that we see and the, and the, the ratio between the above uh, wor uh, world data and the underworld data, uh, so to say. And also that, uh, that we, also there, it's not conclusive because yeah, there's several things happening at the same time, the introduction of uh, the, the Delta variant, the introduction of the vaccination. And so, but it, it, it does call for um, yeah, these, these data analytics uh, that Jacobo was also uh, referring to that you, it's not uh, that you just monitor uh, and you get a concentration and then you have all the answers. It is the, the monitoring and the combination of data that you need to do uh, to create uh, the, the answers and uh, create the use cases. Uh, one more thing I'd, I'd like to say is, uh, yeah, we're, I think what we're doing is um, not wasting a good pandemic, uh, if you can call this pandemic a good pandemic, because there is so much, uh, I mean, the, like in other fields, uh, uh, for instance, vaccine development, but also here in this field, there is such a tremendous uh, development in such a, a very short time and um, we have created uh, the, the, the technical infrastructure but also the um, the stakeholder knowledge exchange infrastructure between public health and 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 water sector that is that is needed so um, I'm really uh, very hopeful that um, the, the things that people have already mentioned that uh, other uh, parameters uh, so uh, will be um, bringing uh, the, the wastewater surveillance forward. So 
what what I'm hoping uh, to see is that this pandemic has really boosted the use of wastewater as information source for infectious diseases, but uh, clearly also beyond that. Uh, and that now with the infrastructure more in place, both um, technical and uh, and knowledge uh, exchange, I think um, uh, we will uh, see uh, learn more from our wastewaters in the future. I think in some ways it's comparable to a war. Um, and very, very, very rarely in terms of a war, because at the end of the day, they've always said wartime, you, you get these huge boosts of innovation, a huge boost of development. And I think we're seeing that right here, right now, in terms of wastewater-based epidemiology and in terms of using wastewater as an information source. I think the thing to tease out is two things probably. What further information do we need? What cooperation really should we should we be having to, to develop the art, develop the science? And somebody, somebody's always going to say, which is the question, probably the question of this panel, what value does it bring? To, to a member of public who's not necessarily scientifically uh, astute, um, why are we doing it? Yeah, well, one more thing to say about the the, the sampling. Because, uh, um, the, we were um, discussing earlier that uh, it takes quite a number of samples, and I fully agree that the more uh, frequent samples you take, the better you can see uh, trends. And of course, that comes at a cost, but if we are uh, talking about population monitoring that we're doing through wastewater. So actually, um, it is uh, compared to um, individual testing, it is a relatively efficient way to test what is going on in, in the population, because you only need one sample for a a thousand or ten thousand or even hundred thousand people to understand uh, what is happening, and, and of course, um, it, it, w it will be some time before uh, we trust the wastewater data enough to say, okay, maybe uh, we should really uh, use it as standalone for uh, public health decision making, and maybe that will never happen. Because we will always have. Uh, 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 parallel surveillance systems, but uh, I think as a population surveillance tool, it's a relatively efficient way uh, for any um, anything that we can uh, observe in in wastewater and what, of what happens in society. I would just point out on the sampling frequency or cadence that um, it doesn't necessarily mean we, we we're going to be sampling all the time and we need to be sampling all the time. Again, it depends on what we what our objective is uh, and actually what the value is to go to Oliver's question. Plus there's obviously techniques you can use with data um, where you've got a lot of sensor data. Um, so there are techniques that you can, you know, fill in the gap somewhat. Um, but in the case where you're needing to see maybe, uh, you know, you've got some rapid um, decision to make, then obviously you can look at, because we've got the infrastructure now, as you said, good, yeah, potentially look at surge um, capacity, you know, ramping up testing in a particular area. We've done that during this pandemic. Um, learning the lessons from how we did that is going to be useful. Um, there's one thing I would like to, to, to point out as well is that, um, you know, so Oliver said, who do we need? We definitely need the, the water companies on board. We need them engaged. They've been the, they're, they're obviously the, um, often the data holders and the knowledge holders. Um, but I think the war thing is that we're not facing just one front in terms of war because we've got other factors which are impacting the water industry, such as climate change, et cetera. So the key word for me going forward with WB is resilience. And uh, we also look at public health resilience. And I think that's the that's the, the value is that we'll have, if we do this right, an opportunity to embed uh, resilience, not just in the infrastructure uh, and you know, everything to do with wastewater and water, but in, in our public health um, activities. And that's where I see it. I mean, that's a very top level highlight. There's a lot below that and a lot of individual uh, value um, 
assets or whatever you like to call it. But uh, I think resilience is something we need to focus on. WBE and the way we do it will change as our infrastructure is impacted by factors such as climate change, urbanization, and others, other things. We, we've talked about this a lot also at, you know, at the community level, but as Jim and a few others mentioned, it's also important to think about protecting vulnerable populations and doing this on a smaller scale as well. So penitentiaries, you know, protecting incarcerated people, nursing homes, schools. We've seen a lot of positive examples also um, where they're able to minimize the, the exposure and outbreaks in those cases. So I think ultimately the, the goal is a, a program like you're talking about at the community level where we have all of this data from health agencies coming in also, but um, very, very good potential um, in those smaller areas with sampling programs to to protect population as well. And I, I, I just kind of go into the, the technologies. Uh, when it comes down to, you know, kind of implementing these programs, I think one of the big things that has to happen is kind of advancement in the technology to make these tests easier. When you think of a nursing home or a correctional facility, you, you can get great actionable data there, but a lot of times the you know, the technology skills or the backgrounds of the people maybe running those tests. Um, are they not molecular biologists or epidemiologists? They happen to have maybe a science degree. Maybe they just have some experience running wastewater tests. And now they have to run a extraction of a virus out of wastewater, which is not a trivial thing to do for anybody. And, and really the technologies need to get as close to simple as they possibly can so that somebody with kind of a, they don't have a background, they're not trained in molecular biology, can still run one of these tests, get a good result that, you know, is representative of what's going on in that community, and then it all can come together. But if that test is too complicated, if it's too difficult and the sampling is too difficult, you know, these smaller facilities like nursing homes and correctional facilities, cruise ships, you name it, where you can really help protect a small community, um, the data is not going to be very actionable because you can't trust it. So I think the technologies are going to continue to evolve and get better and better to the point where people with no background or very little background in water testing might be able to still run a good, you know, extraction of virus or extraction of any other target and in, in data that can be trusted. Loma, I know. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Jim. I was thinking of that. We need uh... Uh, besides uh, how to interpret all the data we're receiving, we we need the, the technologies to to develop as well and the protocols as well. We've gained experience with COVID, but we don't know we don't have much experience about, about other substances or pathogens that we're going to be looking for. So we we still need to to develop uh, these technologies to to help us find what we are really looking for. So I just wanted to point that out. So if, if I was going to develop a, what should we say, a, a pathogen surveillance system on a city level, on a area level, on a national level, on a, on a building level, what am I going to need? I'm going to need a, a, a sampling protocol. I'm going to need the technological development. I'm going to need other data sources. What else? Very good logistics. Very good logistics. Um, some open cooperation between organizations. Definitely important. <laughs> um, I, to me, and this is my personal opinion, I think we've, in the UK at least, we've gone away from that public health engineering origins of the water industry. Now, no blame, no anything associated with that. It is what it is. I think with this, the value is we're working collaboratively nationally to almost come back to our public health engineering roots, going back to Jon Snow, dare I say it. Um, which is brilliant, fantastic. There's no, with, with, with the British, and I'm going to take the mickey out of the British again, and the English especially, we're good in an emergency. Um, how do we bring that into business as usual? 
just just quickly on I know I've spoken a lot. Commonality of language is going to be important in that in that sense, you know, because we're going, we're talking about no longer just wastewater people talking to wastewater people, it's wastewater people talking to um, public health, yeah, and mental etc. So just on that point, I'll let other people answer the question. How do we make it a reality? A public health surveillance system. Well, what, we, need to start like? to talk. we need to We would need to see what the public health is looking for. That would be like the first step. You know, talk to them, and brainstorming. Let's see what's what's uh, what's more important for your community. What would you like to to monitor or surveil? For example, like Aaron was saying, uh, focusing on vulnerable, more vulnerable uh, people, and we could target nursing homes or STDs in college dorms and schools, for example, we, to start with, we would need to know what we will want to look for. So Paloma, can I ask you, you're talking maybe it's kind of uh, high granularity, so low scale solutions, is that something that, you know, in Spain is, is the, the thinking rather than, because of the EU Sentinel system, I don't know if you can hear me, the EU Sentinel system, which is looking at all the member states having surveillance, Gert Jan is involved oh, yeah. in that. So that, that's at one scale, which I think is really valuable, but then obviously you're talking at having, you know, engagement at a very small scale, you know, at a local authority or whatever, you want to set up something would they be doing things independently of, say, imagine Spain had a central system as well, or capacity to do a central system? It would um, be great. Would in, yeah. It would be great if this went uh, at national scale. Um, but like I said before, we we need to 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 work together with the public health officials. I know. I, I mean, we could we could start um, by having a small project talking just about Valencia because we've had the experience with COVID, and we could you know propose like a small community level project. But for that to go wider, um, we would need uh, po politicians involved here, <laughs> and we would need to they would need to to cooperate with us. Yeah, I mean that's where we we've been fortunate in the UK that obviously I work for the government. There was buy-in very early on, and you see it in other countries. But some countries haven't had that that luxury, so there's maybe lessons to be learned. Around yes, so on this on this call, we've got Spain, we've got Holland, we've got America, we've got the UK. Talk <laughs> realistically. Um, I mean, there's been so much value provided in 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 the coronavirus outbreak. Is this not something we can do? I mean, off what have a have an innovation fund where there's money available. Is it not I, I think, one of I the think, breakthrough um, cha challenges? Public health engineering. I think one of the things for sustainability and, and getting these programs up and running is really going to be government investment. I mean, there's a lot of research projects, a lot of things at the university level. And there's a few wastewater utilities and public health agencies, at least here in America, that are doing things on their own. But, you know, until like the CDC here in the U.S., and I suspect a similar public health organizations, governmental, invest in this and really buy into it, then I think you can get these programs up and running. But otherwise, it'll just be pockets of researchers and, and people doing this that are really interested in or have the budgets locally to do it. But I really think it's kind of high level governments that really have to invest in this and see it to, to really bring it bring it forward and, and make it sustainable. And I suppose the argument is it will cost more not to. At the end of the day, I mean. Somebody say, OK, uh, yes, but drop off whenever you like, Andrew. Um, so, I mean. I'm 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 quite enjoying this enjoying this this conversation here. So, it, it, it's at, at the end of the day. But from the I'm a wastewater geek. I can absolutely see the value of what's been done. Amazingly, I can see the value moving forward. Um, it, it's just a case of. Do we, is, obviously, 
on the discussion so far, more international collaborations needed. Um, we've seen some great work. Is there not that business case? Is there not that case to build on it? Not, I'm not even going to bring money into this. Is it not a case to build on it? And why it's can't an easy we? Sell. It's an easy sell once you actually demonstrate that it works. Mm -hmm. And so what COVID very early on showed is you can generate data that no one ever had mm -hmm. and it can be potentially quite useful. So we've sort of seen that play out and now we're seeing we're sort of exploring a brand, I mean, it's not brand new, but, but let's just pretend that polio doesn't exist. Um, we're exploring a, a brand new area of science that uh, lots of people who never thought about this are going into it. That's on the academic side. And then there's the industry side, which basically didn't know that there was a business to be had, and they're going to see this as an opportunity. And so all of this sort of, um, is just starting to grind and get into movement. Um, there will be obviously countries where they're outperforming others and they'll have results which show promise. And that will build more momentum. And it's there's a risk, build it and they shall come. I think that's kind of where we are now. There are some countries that have put their chips down. They said, we want this. And they're showing that they're getting some reward. It might not be at this early stage, a very cost-effective reward, but it's showing potential. And what we have right now is what you look like, what it looks like when you cobble together, uh, you know, a program. I mean, we have whatever was laying around is what you're using. We didn't have time to do anything better than that. Yeah. But now, if we see in 10 years' time, we want this streamlined global system we can build fit for purpose instrumentation and infrastructure to deliver that. But you need time and obviously the pandemic is not the greatest time to start to, uh, to, to ramp up businesses because they're all at home, uh, you know, working from home. And so there will be a time where you, if you give it that, um, you know, these shining examples of promise, it will then encourage other countries that have been slow to adopt it to then get on board and say, well, actually, we kind of want to know that too. And if you've done all the hard work and you spent all the money, but now we know how to do it properly. We don't have to waste all of our money to get to where you are. Mm -hmm. And it's not a waste. I mean, it was valuable uh, journey to get where we are. And I think there's a lot of decisions that were made because we had that data, but it was an expensive decision to make. I think some fantastic work's been done and in some ways it's already paid back because uh, yeah in Spain in Valencia you've not got a whole city locked down you've got an area locked down guess what that's a whole load of people who are, are able to work without you've got that advanced warning uh, so public health decisions can be made so in some ways it's already paid back and that's fantastically valuable if you can stop the next pandemic in its tracks before it ever starts, guess what? That's suddenly saved more than a program's ever going to cost. But yeah, granted, you've got... A, I'm understanding it more speaking here because you've got a pro, something that's just, just being developed, just growing. And it's amazing. Matthew, you want to make a point? No, just, just on that Valencia example, actually, uh, I heard an anecdote, why is China doing so well? And they were able to, to initiate lockdowns at even lower scale because of the makeup of their cities. They are very uh, compartmentalised cities where you can say someone in a building and you just shut down that, that little re area and it really stops transmission. No mention of wastewater in that, but that just says to me, Yes, we can learn from different countries, the WB experiences, but maybe have to tailor it to the, the location. Absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think we've had a fascinating conversation. We could literally go on for hours. Um, is there anything, any final something that people want to, want to say? Any final what value does wastewater-based epidemiology bring to society? I just hope that um, 
we can learn and keep on developing this whole technique and just hope another that we, we don't have to go through another global pandemic to actually value this and so I just want to encourage everyone to keep doing what they're doing and young researchers as well <laughs> like me I so, talk yeah. more <laughs> at the end of the day yeah so I'm that there's been a lot of innovations that have happened and I've seen quite a few of them and makes me sound old but um, at, at the end of the day it is about the collaboration we're no longer in a in an isolated world and I think we've got some great experts on this call I think we've had a fascinating conversation I haven't even noticed it's been an hour it's felt like 10 minutes um, so it's a case of What's next? How can we encourage it? Uh, I might do a little plug here. I haven't kickstarted anything yet, but um, following on from a recent conference, I had the idea of having a, a WBE working group through the IWA. I know this isn't an IWA event. Um, been struggling to find champions, but one is on this call and I'll reach out to, to Gertie Ann because I think he's a member of one of the specialist groups in the IWA. So that might be a route, at least for networking and sharing on a global scale, um, but watch this space. Please plug away. That is always most welcome. And um, yeah, I'm sure the IWA will, will certainly, um, certainly uh, support that because it, it is an important thing. And the more, the more we can do, the more events we can set up, the better. So I know I've got a... WBE workshop monitoring in WBE next March um, here in the UK. So if you ever need a home for a conference, just ask and I'll, I, will, I will sort out. So any last points by anyone? Say oh, now for help. You're plugging. Um, I'm, um, uh, uh, we are working uh, and we is uh, KWR together with Michigan State University and PATH and Venti, uh, on a global data um, center um, uh, for the, the environmental data on uh, SARS-CoV-2 or particularly the wastewater, the, the WBE data on uh, um, the data, but um, and th that's my part, uh, particularly um, uh, also collecting use cases, uh, uh, so uh, and and not only collecting for, uh, because we want to know it, but be, because we want to showcase um, good use cases of uh, because I think that's uh, well having sort of a um, uh, uh, a window uh, where you can see all the uh, the good examples of how wastewater based epidemiology was uh, made of to use in this pandemic. Uh, it can also help uh, inspire. Uh, so, um, uh, if you have a good use case, please um, contact me, or and uh, I can find you uh, also. Uh, but um, yeah, I think uh, that's uh, uh, what I wanted to plug here. Any more plugs? And they're most welcome because if it gets WB on the map, more's the better. <laughs> well, I just want want to say that, as Matthew said before. This is a, a, an international problem, and we must not forget this, this virus came from China, perhaps next time comes from, I don't know, India or certain countries of, of Africa. So a lot of investment has to be done, not just in Europe or in the United States, but also in many emerging countries. Uh, let's not create a super bug in the future, so let's, let's just help them and invest a little bit more in these countries to, to, to help them with these kind of uh, early warning systems that we created in, in Korea and Valencia, for instance. So it definitely sounds like the IWA is the right place for it. It's a good call, Matthew. So if there's no more for any more, then I will say thank you to everyone. It has been an absolutely fascinating discussion for a novice like me. Um, and I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you for the invitation. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.